we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is Kathy Rezbeck, and this is our fourth session of Connecting Scientists with Middle and High School Educators. Um, this session is being presented by Beth Trowbridge uh, with the Alaska Center. I keep forgetting exactly the name of the organization. Um, Beth, would you chime in? Center for Alaskan Coastal Studies. There you go. Thanks very much. And once again, this series of webinars is being sponsored by the Alaska National Resource and Outdoor Education Association in partnership with the Alaska Cooperative Extension Service, Project Learn to Trees, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, or ARCUS. And on chat, um, I am ARCUS. We are at March 18th, and we will have one more session in two weeks on April 4th, April 1st at the same time. The speaker will be Mark Clark. He's retired with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the topic will be why is soil important. Um, these sessions are being recorded, and the resulting MP4 files are very, very large, but they are accessible to everyone uh, on this call. Uh, they reside currently on a Dropbox uh, that I have, that I own. And if any of you have a need to, uh, to get to those recordings, uh, just drop me an email, and I will give you instructions of how to get to them. Eventually, they will be housed on the annual website. So once again, um, we are going to be um, encouraging questions. Uh, and during the presentation, um, Beth and I uh, agree that she would rather be uh, interrupted um, than everyone wait till the end. So if you have a question during the presentation, um, I will be monitoring the chat box, and I'll be able to um, to ask those questions um, as the slides go by um, so you don't have to wait to have the questions answered. Um, when you ask a question, of course, you need to press the talk button. And when you finish asking your question, you need to um, unclick the talk button so that um, the answer can, so someone else can talk, basically. So with that, um, let me just ask one more time if there's anyone else just on the telephone. We're going to take a moment. Uh, I think it's very helpful to presenters to kind of know who is on the phone. And I see that uh, uh, Helen has joined us. Welcome, Helen. What we'd like to do um, today to kind of introduce everybody is um, if you would please type into the chat um, a place where you have experienced or lived by the intertidal zone, which is today's topic. So if you would please type something in there um, as an introduction, and then we will kind of go through those so that Beth has a better understanding of who all is on the phone and um, where you're located, or what intertidal zone you've experienced. So go ahead and type in. So I see while you are in Kivalina, and truthfully, I don't have an Alaska map. Are you on the ocean? All right. Great. So I encourage others to type in uh, where they've experienced the intertidal zone or if they live by the ocean. Oh, Helen, you're up in South Florida. 
Um, Helen, by the way, is in no attack. And she wanted to be an oceanographer during high school. Hey, Helen, this would be an interesting presentation for you. Gay lived on Douglas Island, southeast Alaska, and 20 years on the Oregon coast. She is located in Anchorage. There's Russ. He lives in Eagle River. Oh, he attended school on Whidbey Island and had a good view of the tidal zone from the house he lived in. Thanks, Russ. Okay, Shannon. Shannon is in Fairbanks. Oh, but she lived on a houseboat boat in the Caribbean. She also traveled to Sozovia with a marine science class and identified and logged over 150 species. She's also wanted to be a marine scientist. And Brett teaches at Diamond High School in Anchorage. And of course, Anchorage is on Cook Inlet. Oh, so Brett, you and Beth have met. <laughs> okay, Zach grew up, grew up in Oklahoma. That's not too close to the ocean, but moved to Noatak, which is 30 miles east of the ocean in northwest Alaska. Well, thanks everybody. That was um, that was real helpful. I guess I sh I would like to chime in. I um, of course am located in Anchorage, and I lived on Kodiak Island at the city of Kodiak, and I worked for the Kodiak Refuge for a number of years, and so that's where I have done most of my intertidal exploration. So with that, um, I would like to um, turn this presentation over to. Uh, Beth Trowbridge, and she will do some further introductions. And once again, if you have questions as we go along, go ahead and put them in the chat box, and we'll do our best to get all of them answered. All right. Well, thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask you the well. The title of this um, this session is Life on the Edge. So that's what we a lot of times think about the intertidal zone as life on the edge, and we're going to discuss a little bit more about that as we um, explore what that what marine intertidal ecology is all about. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to flip, flip to the next slide, Kathy. And I just wanted to introduce myself with this slide in front. So um, I'm the executive director here at the Center for Coastal Studies in Homer. And um, I'd like to say right off the bat that I'm an educator and a naturalist by profession. I'm not a scientist. But I do have a strong science background. And um, originally, I had planned to teach high school science way back in the start of my college days. I have a degree in northern studies uh, and a teaching secondary teaching certification from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And about 30 years ago, I thought that I'd be teaching science in a rural school somewhere above the Arctic Circle, where a number of you all are right now. But um, my plans changed, and life happens, as we all know. And instead, I found myself in the Gulf of Alaska, um, on the coast in Cordova, and then in Homer. So it was really then, when I got to Cordova, that I began to develop a real passion for marine ecology to partner with the botany and forest ecology that I had been focused on in, in Fairbanks. And then I found my calling in the field of informal education when I worked with the Prince William Sound Science Center in Cordova and developed their education programming and then continued in that vein after I moved to Homer about 18 years ago uh, working with the Center for Coastal Studies. So um, I started out first as an educator and a naturalist and a program director and now I'm the executive director. But I will say that um, I only accepted the ED position with the contingency that I would still be able to go out and do programs. <laughs> Um, during the spring and the summer, because that really is, uh, you know, where my where my love is sharing intertidal and, and forest ecology with with youth and adults. So um, that's uh, you know that's that's what I'm doing. 
So I wanted to also just point out that, you know, in the field of marine ecology, there are a lot of different career connections for um, students and adults while you're working with students. But, you know, there's the path that I took of being a naturalist or, you know, uh, environmental educator, developing curriculum. But um, there's also outreach that can be done if somebody uh, wants to do make brochures, um, create posters, scientific illustration, just having that passion. Um, but they might want to go into the arts instead of uh, the sciences. There's lots of opportunities to do. And then there's the research side of it, which um, I feel like this is a very exciting time for students uh, in particular because the ocean is one of our largely unexplored um, places. And so students that you're teaching right now, students that you're involved in, can be part of figuring out some of the mysteries of the ocean that we just still don't know. It's largely undiscovered, and there's so many opportunities for you to make discoveries. And there's a lot of great programs in Alaska. Some of you are probably familiar with um, the marine biology programs that through University of Alaska Fairbanks as well as Southeast. And right here in Kachemak Bay, we have the Kasutsuna Bay Lab, which um, is partners with University of Alaska Fairbanks where graduate students come down and do research. And part of that is scuba diving. There's a picture there on your slide um, where they do transects and uh, biodiversity studies and whatnot. And they scuba dive, which I think is kind of a cool thing for Alaska. Not uh, cold water scuba diving. I haven't actually done it, but um, it's pretty exciting for um, students and graduate students and people to do. Have any of you been scuba diving before? You can type in if you if you have. I think it's uh, pretty amazing to be doing scientific research underwater. So that's kind of an exciting part of marine biology. Great. Yeah, a lot of you have. I'm not yet. That's how I am, Shannon. I'm not yet, but maybe someday. Um, OK, so we can go to the next slide there. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a background about the Center for Alaskan Coastal Studies and who we are. So we're a nonprofit organization. We've been around for over 30 years. And our primary focus is to provide hands-on science-based coastal ecology programs for youth, families, and adults. So we're the only organization in Alaska that offers a residential science education program to school groups on a you know, you know, kind of a formal setting during the school year. We also do onboard oceanography programs in the spring and summer. So we give classes an opportunity and individuals to go out on a boat and actually do um, oceanographic sampling, the plankton toes, water quality measurements, learn about ocean acidification, um, and its potential impact on the resources of Kachemak Bay. We do summer group programs, natural history tours, and camps. And we also have a very strong stewardship component to all of our programs. And one of our longest standing programs is the Kachemak Bay Coast Walk that's down there in the right, right hand corner of your slide. And we've been doing that for um, 30 years, and we've been promoting that all around the state. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be up in, I might be up in Kivalina actually this fall doing a beach cleanup. But anyway, trying to promote both youth and adults to help clean up the beaches and keep track of um, the marine debris and, and then also prevent marine debris from impacting our ocean. So we do a very strong program every fall in marine debris and cleanup as, a, um, as part of our stewardship program. Have any of you been to um, our field station? I know Brett, you did. Did you do the you did the teacher academy with us? Is that true? Yes, that's what I thought. Um, has anybody else been to either our field station, the Peterson Bay field station, or the Consistent Bay Lab? So you, um, Shannon, how long ago was it that you were in Seldovia? OK. Were you at the new facility um, at the Consistent Bay Lab? Oh, good. OK, yes, it's a beautiful facility. So. Well, great. OK, so um, we're going to go ahead and dive in unless there's any questions before before we dive in. Okay, with that, um, 
Kathy, do you want to go ahead and switch to the next slide? Okay. All right. So um, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Alaska coastal ecology, and with the main focus being on intertidal ecology. So we're going to learn about how marine organisms are adapted to survive in one of the harshest environments out there, and how their relationships with other organisms and their environment determine where and how they can live. We're going to learn about um, some of the physical factors, such as currents, tides, and a changing ocean, and how they affect who can live where and why. Um, how geological processes and events shape the beach substrate, you know, the, the mud, the sand, the clay, the cobbles, the rocks, and how um, this can give you a clue about what organisms are going to be able to live there and what you might find in the different areas. And then um, talk a little bit about how place-based education um, and or learning about the environment can foster this appreciation and understanding of where you live and how this is linked to stewardship. Anybody recognize any of those organisms on the screen? A quiz. Quiz number one. Ooh, okay, yeah, line chitin. And what's ne the the um, organism next to the line chitin? We're not even going to really talk about that today, but that is a brittle star, in case anybody was. And then we are going to talk a little bit about up in that right-hand corner. Um, that is an example of actually a sponge that has taken over the shell of a snail, and we're going to talk a little bit about those relationships between organisms. So, um, so it's like a walking sponge. All right, let's. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So, um, currents. So, one of the keys to understanding marine ecology and the factors that influence ocean productivity is understanding the ocean circulation patterns. And these are the major currents that are the drivers of the system. Currents are just one way that water moves through the ocean system. And the Gulf, this is a picture of the Gulf of Alaska. And in the Gulf of Alaska, we have the North Pacific Current that travels from west to east. It bumps into the Alaska Current and the California Current when it reaches the coast. And um, from there, uh, the offshore Alaska Current travels up north from British Columbia and then west towards the Aleutian Islands. Uh, east of Prince William Sound, the Alaska Coastal Current will split off and flow closer to the shore. And then there's smaller currents that branch out. They go in between. You can see in that uh, brown line um, that is the Alaska Coastal Current, how it goes along the shore. It will branch out, uh, circle around Kodiak, find little uh, straits to go through. It actually will come into Cook Inlet and then into Kachemak Bay. And um, when it is these smaller currents that branch off and head up into Cook Inlet and Kachemak Bay, uh, are driven by seasonal changes in temperature, freshwater influence, tides, and storm that help create these upwelling, upwelling, sorry, that mix nutrient-rich waters, bottom waters, with the less rich surface waters. And that's really what drives the ocean system, this constant mixing of the deep ocean with that surface. Um, and this is really the, this Alaska stream and the Alaska coastal current are considered the Marine invertebrate superhighway. So that's where um, all the things that we love to eat um, are traveling along the coast of Alaska. <clears throat> right. So then the the uh, those bars there. Thank you, Kathy. And um, those bars there do represent the amount of precipitation that is in each location and the influence that that can have the fresh water mixing with the um, salt water at each location. So that creates an even richer uh, environment. I'm sorry that I don't have a picture of the whole, all the currents in Alaska, but I do have some um, slides and some place, uh, some resources that you can look and see the different patterns that, that are in the, around the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Strait and up into the Arctic. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So one of the things that um, that I wanted to talk about before we even explore who's living where and why is to talk a little bit about 
the changing oceans because right now our oceans are in a period of very rapid change. Um, ocean temperatures are rising, um, threatening both the distribution of marine organisms and the thermal haline currents that act as a conveyor belt of water and nutrients through the world's oceans. And the amount of Arctic Ocean covered by sea ice is rapidly decreasing each year. And this loss can dramatically alter the Arctic food web from the algae to, and the plankton all the way up the food chain. And that's what this one uh, diagram is showing. And with the sea ice melting, or you know, the reduction in sea ice, we're really seeing a big change in some of those ecosystems up in the Arctic. The Gulf of Alaska, in the Gulf of Alaska, the crab and shrimp populations decrease, have decreased while species like the walleye pollock and the Pacific cod have increased dramatically. And these changes in biodiversity, they may be caused by a combination of overharvesting and then these cascading effects within the food ch chain. So when, um, when you see a reduction in plankton or some of the primary producers, then that's going to go all the way up the food chain. Overharvesting of marine mammals and also some unsustainable fishing practices have also led to significantly altering the functioning of marine ecosystems. So I think, you know, looking at this one graph, the changing biodiversity, um, there has been just a big change in the different types of marine mammals. This is what this is showing in the North Pacific Ocean and the Bering Sea. And they're still trying to figure out exactly what some of that is caused by, but it has, it has changed significantly. So alterations in food chains can happen from the bottom up or the top down. And from the bottom up perspective, it's changes in water temperature, changes in salinity, and the nutrients that can alter phytoplankton population, which is, you know, phytoplankton are the base of every marine food chain or food web. Has anybody had any experiences with um, a change in the biodiversity of a coastal community that they are living around now, how you know, you've seen a shift in the types of either fish that are normally found there or marine mammals that are found there. Has anybody witnessed this firsthand? I know in Cachemac Bay, okay, pike invasion, yeah. In Kachemak Bay, um, you know, we are seeing a shift in the halibut population, um, you know, going from uh, halibut being smaller than they used to be, you know, the giant halibut, um, but now they're getting smaller. The herring populations in Prince William Sound, there's a lot of different factors about that, but the herring populations have uh, really decreased. In whales, migration of the whales. Some of the, um, I'm just trying to read through the, yeah. Yeah, and I don't know if the Prince Room Sound Shrimp is recovering. Um, I haven't heard that it is. So, so there are some big changes, and some of it is, is due to what we're going to explore with temperature and um, fresh water and just climate change in general, and some is due to human impacts, such as overfishing or uh, management of resources, and some. Some they just really, quite frankly, don't know what's the cause of some of the declines. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So um, we've heard a little bit about ocean temperatures from the previous slide, but this graph on the left shows um, the rising increase in sea surface temperature over the past hundred years or more. And so you know we have seen a gradual increase in the sea surface temperature, which is driving a lot of the changes that we're seeing in the oceans right now. The graph on the right, or the, the illustrations on the right, um, show the other significant change in the oceans, which is ocean acidification. And um, how many of you are familiar with ocean acidification? I'm sure everybody's probably heard of it, at least. Okay. So um, ocean acidification is a term that we use to describe the changes in the chemistry of the world seas. 
Primarily, it's a result, uh, believe, of the um, burning of fossil fuels. Since the Industrial Revolution, there's been a sharp increase in atmospheric CO2, and the oceans have absorbed up to half of this excess CO2. So we're not going to really talk about ocean acidification in great detail. I have in one of your resources that I sent to Kathy, there's um, a lot more information and some great links to some websites that not only will help you learn more about ocean acidification, but for those of you that are teaching, um, has some great interactive games and uh, video clips and things like that that really uh, give a, tell the story of ocean acidification very well. But what I want to really pass on during this session is it's the importance to know that the changes in ocean acidification directly impact the marine organisms that are living in the intertidal zone. The change in ocean chemistry is lowering the pH and causing the ocean to be more acidic. This reduces the availability of the carbonate ions, which many sea creatures use to build shells and skeletons out of the calcium carbonate. So it impacts organisms such as plankton, corals, and mollusks the most, because they'll struggle to build or maintain their protection, their protective shells, and their supportive skeletons. And as you can see from the ocean food web, um, you know, these, the plankton, the mollusks, and the corals, especially the plankton and the mollusks, are the base of the ocean food chain. So what impacts the bottom part of the food chain is going to, you know, directly move up to the top of the food chain. So that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of concern about ocean acidification and, and what those changes are going to mean to the organisms that are living in the ocean. Are there any questions? Simple questions? Well, that should be simple, but. OK, um, let's move on to the next slide then. So another driving force in um, marine ecology is what we call nutrient, nutrient dynamics. So the primary productivity, or the amount of carbon fixed into the food chain through photosynthesis, is very seasonal. In summer, the rate of primary production is high due to the increased daylight hours. In spring and fall, the production shifts with the increasing, with the increasing or decreasing amounts of light. Phytoplankton and macroalgae, which we are seaweeds, make up the main source of the primary productivity and feed the rest of the marine food chain. Zooplankton feed off of phytoplankton. So what you see here on the left is a very cool satellite picture of um, a phytoplankton bloom in the Gulf of Alaska last year in May. So anywhere where it's green, um, you know, that's going to show that's the phytoplankton that is, uh, is blooming in the, off the coast. And just as a, reflect, or a little refresher, um, phytoplankton are the plants of the sea, and zooplankton are the animals of the sea. So um, in this slide, does anybody know which one of those pictures are the phytoplankton and which are the zooplankton? So, yeah, so the phytoplankton, of course, they have the chlorophyll, so they are uh, creating their, using their, uh, the sunlight to create food, so the green does show up. And then the zooplankton are the little animals there kind of on the left side, the diatom. Yep. So um, just looking at the phytoplankton, because, you know, plankton, by definition, don't, can't move on their own in the water. They rely on the currents um, and the tides and whatnot to move them. So they, they can't, they don't have you know, ways to move. Um, the phytoplankton need to use sunlight to produce food. So in looking at the phytoplankton, picture of the phytoplankton, can you see some strategies that they have in order to be able to float near the surface of the ocean? Way they need to survive, grow. One clue is um, looking at 
So the more surface area, just kind of going back to physics, um, the more surface area that uh, the plankton have, the easier it is to float, right? So some of the phytoplankton form chains. So you can see in both those pictures of the phytoplankton some of the, the chains of different cells that are, um, oh, good, a little hand there. I didn't realize you could do that. Yep. Um, so the chains that, that make them longer so they can float on the surface. The other, um, the other strategy is to have appendages, like hairs and things that stick out that create more surface tension that allow them to float. So good. And then in the bottom right hand um, corner is a picture of a plankton, uh, plankton tote. So on our, as mentioned on our onboard photography program, we go out and we uh, do a plankton tow, which is basically to put a fine mesh net that has a jar at the end of it. Um, you know, tow it behind a boat, but you can do it just walking along a dock. We walk along the dock or the shore and tow it, and it filters down, and you can catch those plankton in the um, jar and then look at them under a microscope. All of these plankton are you're seeing are microscopic, so you don't necessarily see them um, without very well without looking at a microscope. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to do the plankton shows and to see the difference. So, um, so if you were doing a plankton tow on May 9th of 2014, do you think you'd find more phytoplankton or zooplankton? Definitely, that's it. Yeah, and so it's all a cycle. So we have these plankton blooms, like the phytoplankton blooms, that then which then draw the zooplankton to eat the phytoplankton, and then and then they'll kind of die off, and then you'll have you know other blooms that happen. So um, and then they're they're driven by the seasonality of the you know sunlight and whatnot. All right, middle of summer. Yep. Yeah. And there's also, they've learned that there are, we used to think that there were just the plankton blooms in the spring and the summer when it was warm, but they, uh, researchers have also found that there are uh, significant plankton blooms that happen in September as well. Okay, let's move to the next slide. <clears throat> so glaciers, melting glaciers, Thermal expansion of the ocean and melting ice sheets are all contributing to sea level rise, which is another um, issue with the ocean environment, ocean ecosystem. Sea level rise is predicted to change the shape of the coastlines around the globe. Do any of you live in areas that where you've seen a change in glaciers, like the one that uh, the picture that I have there on the right hand side, McCall Glacier in Alaska? So data show that on average, yeah, definitely Mendenhall. Data show that on average, snow and ice cover in the world's mountain ranges have declined. The runoff increases the volume of water flowing into rivers and lakes, which in turn ends up in the seas. There is a big question as to how much the polar ice sheets will contribute to future sea level rise. The world's three ice sheets, Greenland, West. Antarctic and East Antarctic are vast bodies of ice containing billions of gallons of frozen water. So right now their contribution to the average sea level rise is relatively small, but they are projected to become major drivers in the future. Um, the past, this past winter has been a great illustration too of how the dynamics of the reduced reduction in Arctic sea ice has the power to influence the global jet stream. So that's been a major driver in bringing the colder, wetter system to the Midwest and New England, and the drier, warmer weather to Alaska. So we we just lived through uh, one of the major impacts of the re reduction in uh, sea ice up uh, up north. Any questions about um, the impact of glaciers?
some fish on the ocean system. So um, one thing that I can say about the jet stream, and uh, I will I will actually maybe pass on to Kathy um, some illustrations of how you know the jet stream cir circulates you know the globe, and it it has gone in pretty predicted patterns. But with the reduction of the um, the Arctic, the sea ice in the Arctic which has caused more water to be exposed and then also a warming, you know, less reflection and a warming, it's actually caused the jet stream to shift. So whereas it typically um, the cold weather would come across Alaska and the, and the warmer weather would stay on the east coast, it's actually shifting, kind of making a um, more of an S curve. The S curve has shifted so that it's now bringing that that warmer weather or colder weather weather down to the east coast and the um, midwest, whereas in the typically there hasn't been these dramatic S curves. Um, it's a little hard to explain, but think of the jet stream. Think of just a really gentle kind of um, easy wave that typically is how the jet stream would move, but with uh, the warming temperatures of the sea and the reduction of the ice has caused it to become more drastic and have wilder swings, which is causing wilder weather around the globe. Does that make sense? Sort of. And I will, um, I will try to send a graphic because once you see the graphic, it will, um, it will make a lot more sense. All right, let's um, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, and we're just going to stay here briefly. So, underlying geological processes and the surface activity of erosion and deposition is going to determine the types and stability of the substrate that's available for the colonization of intertidal plants and animals. So the difference in a boulder covered beach like the one on the top right hand corner and a beach made up of smaller cobbles and mud um, are going to make a difference to the animals that can live there and, why, and how they can live there. Also things like um, wave dynamics and um, exposure are going to make a big difference and those are all driven by geological uh, processes and then how, um, how the erosion is happening in deposition. So let's move on to the next slide. So we talk about the intertidal zone as an area of edges. Really it's basically where the land meets the sea. Um, it's by definition an edge area or what's called an ecotone for the land and the ocean. Edge ecosystems have high numbers of species or high species risk richness because they provide a combination of environments in very close proximity. So, you know, as opposed to being totally terrestrial or out in the middle of the ocean, I mean, you have very, uh, you have a higher diversity in those areas where the land meets the sea or, or other kind of edge environments, you have higher diversity. Um, this increases the number of potential niches that animals can live in and allows more different types of organisms to live there. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, just briefly, the movements of the tides create the conditions of life in the inner tidal zone. The tides are going to carry nutrients and food items along with larval forms of many animals that spend their adult life in the intertidal zone. So I think that's one of the, the neatest things about um, understanding plankton is to realize that some plankton will spend their life as plankton and won't change, but a lot of the plankton that we uh, find in our plankton toes and that's floating on the streams are actually intertidal uh, invertebrates that are going to settle out. They're the sea stars and the barnacles and um, those kinds of things that spend their, their initial stages of life as plankton in the water. Many organisms even time their reproductive cycles to coincide with the tides. And um, just as a low refresher, tides are partly caused by the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun on the Earth's oceans. The moon's pull of the ocean is stronger than the sun's because it's closer to the Earth. And then throughout the year, 
the size of the tides will change, and these changes are due to the alignment of the sun, moon, and the earth as kind of shown in that picture. So we have our um, you know our spring tides and our um, uh, that are are typically larger. And I put the tide book there on the right hand side because anybody that lives in a coastal community needs to know how to read a tide book. We spend a lot of time showing um, showing kids and adults how to read tide books. We have two tides a day. Patchamac Bay, we're uh, pretty lucky to have a very high tidal range. Cook Inlet, of course, has a little bit higher, but 20, you know, 26 feet or so is our um, tidal range. Um, so that's pretty. Yeah, Seldovia, it has a great tidal range as well. So let's move on. I'm worried about time. Um, so uh, just talking a little bit about the, the macro, macro algae. We're not going to spend a lot of time on, um, on algae, but there are three types of macro algae that can be found in the intertidal zone. Um, they provide both food and shelter for organisms that live there. And they can basically be divided up into green, brown, and red algae. Um, brown algae are the most abundant. And does anybody, um, does anybody know a different name for rockweed? That's on the right hand side there and covering most of the rocks. Top quiz. That was a hint. A little clue. So rockweed has also been known as popweed because as you can see, um, there if you look a little bit closely at the little sacks, a little little hand, um, you can squeeze those and pop them, which is um, Kind of a fun thing to do, and yeah. Um, and has, does anybody know what the significance of algae and seaweed are in the foods we eat? The gel is really good for sunbirds. It's also really good as hair gel as well. So if you're out on the tide pooling and you're having a bad hair day, you can squirt some popweed um, gel into your hair and. Look better. The kids have a lot of fun doing that. All right. Um, what about some food that contains seaweed? Anybody know of any? Milkshakes, ice cream, yeah, and then of course sushi we eat. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's move on and get a little introduction to some of the animals that live in the intertidal zone. So one of the um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, what we call the Fab Four phylum. So these are the main four um, phyla that you are most likely to find in the intertidal zone. So we're going to take a brief look at each one. We're going to learn about their special characteristics, and then we're going to try to see how they fit into that intertidal ecology picture. So we have the cnidarians, the mollusks, the conidarians, and the arthropods are what we're going to focus on. And of course, there are a lot more, but we're not gonna. We don't have time to cover all of them. Um, so let's go ahead and meet our first fabulous phylum. Into the next slide. All right. So the first phylum that we wanted to focus on are called the cnidarians, and the characteristics of cnidarians are that they have uh, stinging cells. And there's a little diagram in the right-hand corner of the nematocysts that make up that stinging cell for the cnidarians. They have a radial symmetry. Um, they all have sac-like bodies, you, and they use these for gas exchange and digestion. They're primarily carnivorous. They come in two forms, either polyp or medusa. And some of um, the animals that are in this phylum include the sea anemones. So they have a Christmas anemone and the frilled anemone and the burrowing anemone. And then we're going to meet um, one of the other famous, uh, famous organisms in this phylum on the next slide. So uh, yeah. So the sea jellies are another cnidarian. Um, they're also called jellyfish. You might know them as jellyfish. They, um, they also, just like the uh, plankton, the they come in bloom, so we have big sea jelly blooms, 
at different times of the year. Um, they have no specialized digestive, nervous, respiratory, or circulatory systems. They are um, efficient swimmers, and they do this by expanding and contracting their body. They eat plankton, crustaceans, small fish, other jellies. Um, some are very toxic, not all, but some are. Um, some of those stinging cells, some can, uh, some are very toxic. And one thing that we have noticed is that, our scientists have noticed, is that the warming oceans and changes in pH seem to uh, be favorable for sea jellies. We're seeing more uh, sea jelly blooms. We're seeing more sea jellies um, washing up on the coast. And um, they seem to be one of the organisms that are benefiting from some of the changes that we're seeing in the ocean. Anybody, um, I see that somebody has been stung once. Uh, we have a lot of moon jellies and lion mane jellies in, in Catchmack Bay. What about in other places? Oh, former Saner, so. Got a stung in your eye from a jellyfish? <laughs> yeah, I know that fishermen like to, they need to wear sunglasses or glasses when they're picking fish so that they don't get stung by the, by the sea jellies. All right, let's move on to our next. OK, so the mollusks. OK, next phylum here. So one of the characteristics of a mollusk is that they have a muscular foot. Um, that is, that's how they move, is by a muscular foot. They have a mantle that's going to secrete the, an internal or an external shell. They're soft bodied. They have different feeding methods. And this is a very diverse group. So some are filter feeders, some are grazers, and some are predators. Um, the grazers and the predators have something called a radula, which is a file-like organ that they use for scraping, grasping, biting, drilling, or tearing. So I see that somebody recognized the mossy chitin, which is the middle, um, in that middle picture. Any other, they recognize any of the other species? Okay, the black katie chitin is on the right top side. I know, I don't know how we, we did find some gumbu chitins. They were very big. So one of the characteristics of the chitin, which um, the top two, the, and the middle one, and the right hand side, the characteristic is that they have eight overlapping plates. And that's uh, that you can see on the back of their bodies. And so those are almost always vo visible in the chitons. They, um, they, are, they stick very tightly to the rocks. They do move, but they move very, very slowly. Um, but they, they have, their foot is very, uh, you have to pry them off the rocks if you're going to get them out. And yes, that's a periwinkle down on the bottom. Uh, small periwinkle, they're typically small, that is attached to the seaweed. And then we also have a couple limpets there. A plate limpet and a white cap limpet. All right, let's move on to the next. The so nudibranchs. Right, the darkies. And so that is the other um, the other name for the king chitons that are um, a big subsistence food for people that live in Catchmack Bay. So the nudibranchs, I, I had to give them their own special page because they are one of my most favorite um, of the uh, sea organisms. So the nudibranchs, I would say, have no shell. So even though they are moths, but they have no shell. They all have two pairs of antenna or antennae. They come mostly in very bright colors, which warn predators not to eat them. Um, they're rarely eaten by other animals, so they kind of live a oh, little neck clam. I'm not sure. There wasn't a little neck clam on that page. Oh, wait, yes, OK. It was a clam. Sorry about that. I was 
focused on the limpets and the chitons. Yes. Okay. Um, so they're rarely eaten by other animals. They they are hermaphroditic, and um, you know they're they're typically small. They are typically about three inches long, and it's a very rare treat to be able to see them in the water. Okay. I see. So some of the different things about the nudibranchs, um, the opalescent nudibranch is uh, likes to live in rocks, work pilings, mudflats, um, very aggressive animal, attacks its own species, and scavenges on dead animals. So they can be, uh, they look so beautiful, but they can also be um, a little scary in the intertidal, in, in the intertidal zone. All right, let's go on to the next Beth, topic. Which, Beth, which one is the opalescent? The one in the right, bottom right. All right, let's go to the next slide. So this is one of my favorite snails. Um, this is a moon snail. And uh, have any of you ever encountered What's shown up in that right hand, uh, right corner, it looks like a piece of rubber or a piece of tire. You see them a lot um, if you're walking, especially in kind of more of a sandy, muddy uh, intertidal zone. And it, you very rarely see them with the moon snail. But these are actually the egg, egg cases of a moon snail. So on the left hand side, there's a picture, and I actually saw this when I was in um, Yakutat. It's one of the first time I've seen them both together. So the moon snail on the left-hand side has just laid or made that ring. They mix uh, their eggs. They lay thousands and thousands of eggs within this ring. And if you were to hold up this ring, it would be it would look like a kind of like a slinky or a big spiral. It's it's actually uh, six or seven layers long and comes apart like a like a spiral. And the moon snail mixes the sand and the mud with the eggs when it lays the circular um, spiral egg case, and then it goes away. And um, so you very rarely see them together. What's really cool about the moon snail is uh, you can just barely see that red part is its foot. And the moon snails have an enormous foot um, that helps them to move. And they are also a predatory snail. So um, they have one of those radulas that we were talking about. They'll actually drill a hole in um, a clam or um, another uh, species, a bivalve or of some sort or whatever, and they'll drill the hole and they'll eat the insides out of it. So um, sometimes it's fun if you know that you have moon snails around, you've seen the egg case, or just if you're walking along the beach with kids and you find a, a shell that has a perfect circle. Just like the one in the bottom right hand corner, then that is the evidence of a moon snail murder. And uh, it's kind of fun to find those on the beach um, to be able to see that there is evidence of, of moon snails. Has anybody found shells with those perfect circles? Or seen evidence of a moon snail murder? All right, let's move on to the next. All right, so our bivalves. So by definition, the bivalves have um, two shells that are joined by a single ligament. Um, they have uh, their mantle produces the shells. Some produce pearls, like the oysters. Um, uh, I, I put a, did a close-up of the mussels because they have what are called thistle threads, and um, these will help them. These help them cling to the sides of a rock, and um, the thistle threads are extremely strong. And they've actually been doing research to try to replicate the glue that's found in the thistle threads to be able to use for um, other scientific 
purposes it's so strong. So the muscles have these bristle threads. They are filter feeders, and um, so they are filtering the plankton out of the uh, out of the water in order to eat. And it's one of the reasons why they are um, good indicators of water quality in the intertidal zone, or why sometimes if there is something like um, a red tide, or where there's the bad, you know, the diatoms that can make you sick in the ocean. That's why they tell you to not eat the mussels and the clams because they will uh, concentrate the toxins because they are filter feeders. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner is the Pacific razor clam. Yep. Anybody been razor clam digging? And then a butter clam up there in the top right corner. Okay, let's move on to the last of our mollusks, which are the octopus. And it's pretty interesting to think that the mollusks range from the, you know, the clams and um, the uh, snails and the mussels all the way up to the octopus. The octopus has um, the only hard part of an octopus body is its beak. And uh, and you know the, they say, and I have witnesses that the, as long as the beak, that hard part, can fit fit through any kind of a hole or crack or crevice, then the whole octopus can fit through. So they are very um, they are amazing animals. This is a Pacific octopus. It can live three to five years. Um, have a 14 foot arm span. They live in dens. There's a picture of one kind of in its den down there in the bottom right hand corner. And when you are in the intertidal zone, if you look for um, a, a nice crevice in a rock that has bits and pieces of shells and um, crab pieces and whatnot around it, then you probably found the midden pile for an octopus. And that means that an octopus probably is inhabiting that den because they will eat um, they'll eat uh, other uh, crabs and clams and things like that. They are, they are very intelligent animals, and uh, I could go on and on about them. They're pretty amazing, but they they are uh, quite defined in the intertidal zone. All right, let's move on. Echinoderms. So this is the third in our um, phylum. So the characters of echinoderm, they are um, five, they have five pointed radial symmetry. So you'll find that in the sand dollars, the sea stars, the sea cucumbers. It's sometimes hard to see, but um, but it's there. Um, they have a very unique water vascular system. So they have they have two feet that allows them to move and actually pumps water um, into it, allows them to move. And um, some members of this phylum include the sea stars, the sea urchins, and the sea cucumbers. They have a spiny skin. Echinoderm means spiny skin. Let's um, move on to some other examples. All right, so um, some sea stars that are here. We have the leather sea star in the, in the left-hand corner. Does anybody recognize any of the other sea stars? The one in the bottom right, the pycnopodium, or the giant sunflower star is one of the largest of um, the sea stars that are found in the intertidal. They're found in the lower intertidal zone. They're very um, carnivorous. And um, one of the interesting things about the way that sea stars eat, they'll move with their two feet. They, they eat clams and mussels. That's some of their favorite foods. They're going to move along the intertidal zone, find a clam, uh, cover it with their body. Their two feet will pull apart. The, um, the shell, and then their stomach actually comes out of their body and digests and eats the clam outside of the body and then, uh, and then comes back in. So if you find a sea star that's humped over, uh, like in a big hump, it's probably having a snack, a clam snack. I wanted to point out the sea star wasting disease. It's one of the, is this example in the left hand corner. Um, so that, uh, that's something that we're seeing as the oceans warm. We're not exactly sure what the disease, what's causing the disease, but they have seen it a lot in the Pacific coast. 
and we are just starting to see some uh, signs of it here in Kachemak Bay. So that's something that we're monitoring for. Okay, let's move on. Sea urchins. Again, there's that five um, five symmetry there. With the if you were to open up a sea urchin, they're a favorite food of uh, of Sea otters, and in fact, some some places where the sea otter population is very high, then um, the sea urchin population will go down. And if there aren't sea otters there to control the sea urchin population, they are algae eaters, and sometimes they can destroy an air tidal zone where um, they'll they'll eat the algae and and eat the primary producers. So let's move on to um, the next slide. So this is our last phylum. So this is the arthropod, and arthropod means jointed foot. So this is a very large, diverse group, bilater bilaterally symmetry. So the same on you know two sides. These are animals with jointed legs. They have exoskeletons. Um, they generally grow by molting. So you'll recognize some of the members of this family: the crabs. Um, and the barnacles, those are all arthropods. <clears throat> they have two pairs of antennae. They have compound eyes. And they breathe or respire through gills. So some members of this phylum, the, uh, the crab in the left-hand corner, barnacles in the middle. But then there's also um, isopods and amphipods that belong to this group. Uh, they have just like the invertebrates that you learned about uh, last in the last session, the macroinvertebrates for the freshwater. These arthropods also they have segmented bodies. They have a head, thorax, and abdomen. So there's crabs, shrimp, um, and sea spiders. So let's move on to the next slide. Yes, which is the rock mouse? Um, I I don't. Recognize either one as a rock louse, but okay. I I just have it as an isopod and an amphipod, so um, Kay might be able to identify it down to species better than I can. But that is a bee. Kay, Kay, would you like to um, clarify, or shall we move on? Okay. All right. So, um, barnacle, shrimp, and crabs. Barn one of the interesting things about barnacles is um, they are filter feeders, and um, they start out as uh, as plankton in the ocean. They float around on the current. They find some place that they want to settle out, and then they attach to a rock or a surface by cementing their head. To that rock or, or surface. So basically, they're doing a handstand. They're cementing their head, and their feet are what they use to filter feed. So in that picture of the um, barnacle on the left-hand side, is those are the legs or the feet coming out and filtering the plankton out of the water. Barnacles are incredibly uh, resilient, and they can live in that upper intertidal zone because, as you can see in the picture right next to where you're seeing the filter feeder, they have ways that they can actually close up and completely um, protect their insides from sun and whatnot, so they don't dry out. So they, um, you'll find them in places in very unusual places, high up in the intertidal zone. You also find them on whales. So they have attached to um, to whales and some of the the uh, humpbacks and the bowheads have barnacle colonies living on them. Um, shrimp, and then we have our crabs. So Dungeness crab, king crab, and then the hermit crab, which is in that right-hand corner. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so we're going to just try to try to put it together. Who lives where and why? So um, we have a rock cloud up there. It's not vertical. So in the intertidal zone, there's different what we call zonations. And there's the splash zone, which is at the top, or the spray zone, the middle intertidal, 
the lower inner tidal and the extreme inner tidal. And one of the factors that influences who can live where and why is how much time they're exposed to the elements, to the air. So some of those animals like the mussels the, and, and the uh, barnacles that can close their shells and protect themselves from drying out, you'll find in the higher um, high tide zone. Animals such as the sea stars, like the um, the sunflower star that is uh, relies on water to be able to move, is not going to live in a place where there's no water. So when the tide goes out, you're only going to find them in the very kind of extreme or the lower inner tidal area, the place where they're going to have to be in the dry air for the least amount of time. And um, Things like hermit crabs and um, some of the snails, if they can crawl under some of the algae or find rock crevices to live in, then they can um, survive a little bit further up in the inner tidal zone. So those adaptations that they might have of being able to keep themselves from drying out um, will determine at which level in the inner tidal zone that they can live, and um, which is why you you would only see why well, a lot of people like to go tide pooling at extreme low tides because there's you know the water's out farther and that's when you're going to see some of those sea anemones and sea stars and things, sea cucumbers that need to stay wet and moist. If some of you need to leave, that's fine. Um, we've lost Beth temporarily, and I'm guessing she will call back. But if you have to leave, thanks for joining us. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. It happened last time, too. We don't know why it happens either. Just a drop cell phone call. OK. Are there still people on? There are. OK. Okay. Um, thanks for filling in, Kay. Some fun facts, intertidal zone fun facts. Um, one thing that I wanted to kind of get back to was that when we looked, remember way back when, at the beginning of the slideshow, we saw some different areas that were had you know big boulders or small cobbles um, or a sandy beach. So. Where do you think you would find more animals on a sandy beach or in a rocky inner tidal? <clears throat> so more, you're going right, you're going to find more animals in the rocky inner tidal because the more cracks and crevices and the places where um, where animals can hide or kind of stay wet when the tide goes out. Then the more um, the the more animals and the more diversity that can live there. One of the um, one of the big things that drives the inner tidal zone is um, the predator prey relationship, or um, it's trying to stay alive. So those animals are are having to deal with a lack of water and um, 
always trying to protect themselves from being eaten or having to find things to eat. So that is a big driver um, in the inner tidal zone. Let's go to the next slide. So some of the um, adaptations that these animals have to be able to live in the, in the inner tidal zones where they live, um, the two feet that the sea star has, so that allows them to move very, um, very well in the inner tidal zone. They are a main predator of a lot of those animals that live a little bit higher in the inner tidal zone. So the, um, the clams and the mussels, they live higher. So they are, the sea stars can't get to them all the time because when the tide is out, the sea stars don't have water to um, make their two feet work. So they, they can't always reach them. That's one of their um, adaptations. Limpets and uh, chitons, they can clamp down really tightly to a, to a rock and stay moist when the tide goes out and also kind of get protect from uh, predators. Sea anemones, we didn't talk a lot about them, but they can fold inward and kind of uh, stay, stay moist and keep that water locked in. We saw the trap door on the barnacle. And, um, and then the mussels have that, that attachment thread. So those are all things that help them live in different areas in the inner tidal zone and either eat, uh, eat organisms or keep from being or eaten by other organisms. So let's move on to the next one. So just a couple more here. So friends and enemies. So competition, um, grazing, predation, uh, that is a big part of living in the intertidal zone. There's, there's little space. And you can see on that right-hand corner, um, this would be a great square to even just do a biodiversity count. You can see uh, barnacles. You can see seaweed. You can see fish eggs or some of the um, snail eggs. If you looked very closely, you can see a mussel. So um, there's a lot of competition for space. Some species are going to be better at crowding in, and they're going to actually crowd, you know, um, crowd out some of the other species. Um, they're going to try to take over as much space as they can. But the better they are at, um, at creating their space and, and staying there, the more uh, chances are that they're going to be able to survive. In the left-hand side, you can see those sea stars. They're just, they, you're going to find them lower in the, on the rocks because they can only last so long with the water being out because they rely on the water to be able to move. And so they're going to they're going to stick there, and then sometimes you'll see if it's been a longer time when the tide's been out, you'll start to see sea stars starting to droop and not be able to hang on because they've lost the water that's in their two feet. So they need to be in a place where the water's going to come back quickly and allow them to you know pump and circulate that water through their system. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So some of the other uh, relationships that drive who can live where. Uh, like I said, competition that occurs when a number of individuals of the same or different species use a resource that's in short supply. So in the intertidal zone, they're um, competing for space, for food, and for light. Some plants and animals compete by growing on top of other organisms. Um, and sometimes the competition is avoided by specializing and adapting to conditions that other species can't match. So limpets compete successfully for space. By removing newly settled young barnacle spat, they just bulldoze them over off the rock. So barnacles, I said, you remember, I said they settle and they have to settle on a rock. Well, um, when they are first starting out and they haven't really established their shell, then that's when the limpets can come along and eat them, um, and then they can, um, you know, they can take over that territory. That's one way that they compete for that space. Another relationship is mutualism. So that's a relationship where both members of the other relationship benefit from that association. So an example would be like uh, black seaside lichen or orange lichen. So the lichen that grow in the splash zone, they're um, algae and fungus combining for into an organism. The fungus provides the structural support, and the algae provides the photosynthesis, makes the food for both partners. So that's a that's a great mutualistic relationship. Another one is commensalism. So that's there on the left-hand side. That's a relationship where one member um, benefits from the association and is not really affecting the other one positively or negatively. This one is hard to see, but in, in the middle of that sea star is something called a commensal scale worm. And these commensal scale worms, they live on sea stars, on gumbu chitons, 
and they're a great example of this kind of relationship. The scale worms benefit by feeding on the food particles around the mouth of its partner. You see it's around the middle of that. That's where the food is coming out. But the sea stars and the gumboot titans, they aren't harmed by having that scale worm you know, living on them. Another, uh, another type is parasitism. That's there on the right-hand side. That's the relationship where one member of the relationship benefits from the association and the other one is harmed. So here you have the boring sponge and the hermit crab. The boring sponge secretes a substance that dissolves the calcareous shell of mollusks and barnacles. In this case, the shell on the hermit crab. So it penetrates the shell and then takes up residence. And it weakens the shell. So the wandering sponge encrusts the shell of the hermit crab and then hitches a ride with the crab wherever it moves. It eventually will dissolve the shell, destroying the commensal relationship of the crab with the snail shell. So, um, and sometimes it just gets too heavy for that hermit crab. Will a hermit crab even move around anymore? OK, and I think we're almost done. Um, I sent you a whole bunch of uh, a number of activities. The best way to explore and learn more about the inner tidal zone, of course, is to get out on field trips um, and explore the, your beaches. And I would encourage you to um, you know, do some of the activities uh, ranging from just going out on discovery walks and seeing what's out there, doing a biodiversity checklist, just making a list of all the different species that you see. And if you have older kids or you go back to a beach um, a number of times and doing things like transects, and actually uh, presence and absence and actually trying to estimate populations and that sort of thing is a really great activity to do um, with your students. Go to the next slide. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, the citizen mon science and monitoring. So doing things like um, coastal monitoring and beach cleanups um, are a great way to, um, to instill that sense of stewardship for the environment. There's a lot of things in marine debris, the plastics and things like that that are harmful to the organisms that live in the intertidal zone as well as in the ocean. And by going out and cleaning up the beaches and also just monitoring what's living there, then um, you're instilling that sense of stewardship and, and um, ownership in your students. I think that's the end. Oh, here's some resources. Um, we have quite a few resources available through our website. There's some great books. I also uh, included a page of different book uh, resources for people that are more interested in learning more. And then um, some great links to some other good curriculum. The Alaska Seas and Rivers curriculum is a really great one um, to explore more of these topics. The Seaweeds of Alaska has great pictures. Um, and uh, there's more information on the sea star wasting. We have a question, uh, Beth, from Helen about if posters like some of those on the food web, predator prey, et cetera, are available anywhere. OK. I, Helen, I could email you and let you know um, some of the resources that I have or know of where you can get copies of um, I don't. I know of some great posters that um, would be great for a classroom, and then some other websites where you can download some smaller posters and handouts. So I will email you with that. Yeah, you have that email address. I sent it to you with the list yeah. of participants. Yes. Oh, ten thousand snail-like organisms. Yes, that's where it's good to um, to to learn about population estimation when you have to. <laughs> count um, barnacles or snails. So here's my contact information. I do apologize for um, going over and kind of having to rush through those last couple of slides. But you do have a lot of resources that I sent you to learn more about um, the organisms and um, kind of how, how their adaptations and relationships work and what allows them to live in their special, unique uh, niches in the intertidal zone. And then also just some other information about how some of the changes that we're seeing in the ocean are really affecting you know, these organisms. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions through email um, or phone call. So just you know, feel free to get a hold of me if you need to or want to. Are there any questions right now? 
is for people that have got to run. Yes. Um, I'd like to thank you, Beth, um, very much for such a great presentation. Um, it, I don't know about anybody else, but it made me want to go out onto um, the intertidal zone right now. <laughs> And um, hopefully everyone will get an opportunity to do that in the near future. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who joined us today. And um, if you need best email, just drop an email to me and I'll forward that to you. Um, we will be meeting uh, for our fifth and final webinar on April 1st at 4 o'clock. And our speaker will be Mark Clark. The topic will be why soil is important. And just a little reminder for those of you who are taking this for um, credit, there will be one final um, meeting webinar on May 13th at 4 o'clock. And we'll let you know more about that later. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you all for joining us, in particular Beth, for such a great presentation. Have a good evening. Thank you. And thank you, Kathy. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>